Hello, I'd like to welcome you to today's Makino Experience Center, or EC. My name is Bill Howard. I'm the product line manager for vertical machining centers here at Makino, and I'm based at the Mason, Ohio headquarters. Our topic today is precision when accuracy really counts. A little housekeeping item we'll take care of before we even get started here. You'll notice there's a chat Q&A button up here. While we're talking, if there's some questions come up that you would like to submit to us, type them in and you'll see your message here. Hit send and those will show up here for us. Hopefully at the end we'll have some time to address as many of those as possible. I'm coming to you from our Mason, Ohio headquarters, which is the building on the right. There's actually two experience centers here. The one we're in, which is experience center number one. There's one down the hall, which is experience center number two. The, the building on the left is our Auburn Hills, Michigan facility. Um, there's two EC or experience centers there as well. So between the two facilities, we have four. I'd like to let you know or encourage you. The idea behind these is this is, provides us with the ability to have very personal, confidential, focused meetings with customers. This allows us to have our team meet with your team so you can have many people involved, we can have many people involved. If you're thinking about a project or a machine, uh, we can, again, get together for a personal, confidential, very focused discussion of your needs and Makino's capability to satisfy those needs. So just so you're aware of that. As I said, today we're going to talk about precision when accuracy really counts. Let me turn on my clicker and we'll get started. Let's start with a little bit of a background. What is a micron? Well, this would be a straight pin. So you're looking at basically 770 microns, 30 thousandths of an inch. Well, by contrast, here's a human hair. That's 100 micron. If we go further, 0.001, one thousandths is 25.4 microns. So that gives you an idea there of the relative size. Pollen floating around in the air is 20 micron. A blood cell, a human red blood cell, 8 micron. So you can see the size of it relative to the straight pin we started out with. One thou is 2.54 microns. And then there's one micron, which is about 40 millionths. It's also one one millionth of a meter or one one thousandth of a millimeter. Um, so obviously we're getting down to one micron is one thousand nanometers. Now, with that in mind, what's expected of a machine tool? When we talk about precision or accuracies, well, let's take a, a typical 40 by 20, that happens to be a a PS105, a Makino PS105. What are the kind of typical tolerances that you might be chasing on a machine like that? Well, about 2 thou to 3 thou. So 50 to 75 micron is typically the range that you're going to be in. But keep in mind, we already said a human hair is about 100 micron. So we're actually chasing tolerances, kind of typical 2 to 3 thou, uh, 50 to 75 micron that are a fraction of the size of a human hair. So gives you some appreciation, hopefully, for tolerances. And again, a mid-size vertical, it happens to be a 40 by 20. We're gonna talk a little bit about geometric error budgeting. What are those errors? Where do they come from? And it gives a whole new meaning by off by a hair. What does that really mean? So we're gonna talk and provide, hopefully, 
a new perspective on precision. Is machine tool structure important? Let's start with the very, very basics. Well, if you think about how do you make a part, and there's four different parts there. Basically, you program X, Y, and Z to get the various features, contours, drilled holes, tapped holes, surfaces of that part. Well, that is critically dependent upon the geometries, which is the structure of the machine. As you'll see there, kind of a classic C-frame vertical. You have X and Y under the table, so Y moves this way, X moves this way, and you have Z on the column. Well, that allows us to create a Cartesian coordinate system by where we can, in a three-dimensional X, Y, Z, have point to point to point to point features of those parts. So therefore, what happens? It's critical that those be square to each other, X, Y, and Z. What happens when they are no longer square? Well, I lose control over those points in that Cartesian coordinate system. So there you can see the, the spindle head is not consistent with the column. They're not running together, they're not square. Is it important? Let's take, this is a kind of an absurd example, but it makes the point. This is kind of a little knee mill, and you can see here it's got a big table, so I'm gonna move the table over, and lo and behold, I mean, it's literally I like taking this planner, and as I get over, you notice what happens? It bows, all right? I've no longer got a flat, straight plane by which X and Y and Z are calculated on, it's bowing. So consequently now, I've lost all control of the points in the volume of that machine tool and machine tool structure. Now, as I said, that's a little bit of an absur absurd example, but it does give you an idea of the importance of machine tool structure. Here's another example, kind of the same thing. Look at that table as we move from one side to the other, there's a very narrow support, again, in the middle, let's take this, very narrow support in the middle, which means as you move side to side, the whole table can deflect or bow. Impact on precision is incredible. Here's an example of a classic C-frame vertical, and it's finite element analyzed, and you'll notice it indicates a lack of stiffness and rigidity. You'll see the table, look at the distortion of the table. It's going from side to side and front to back and there's a lower corner as you can see. The saddle's the same way. Why is the table deflecting so much? Well, typically it's because there's a lack of support underneath the table or the saddle. And the same thing with the bed. Another example Again, a classic C-frame, and you'll notice there what's happening. We've got a lack of stiffness in the spindle and the spindle carrier area. You notice the red and the golds. That's, there's, there's motion, there's movement there. So a lack of stiffness and rigidity. This is the same classic C-frame. And now what you'll notice, again, a lack of stiffness and rigidity in this particular case You'll notice the spindle carrier, how it's literally trying to twist, okay? Which means the column is not supporting. Notice how thin the column is there at the top. It gets wider at the bottom. But when you're all the way up, you can see what happens here. We've got a twist or a bend in the column. Again, what's that doing to your relationship of X, Y, and Z on that machine tool? And last but not least, looking at structures, FMEA analysis. This is a very kind of different structure, you know, but you'll notice it's got the same kind of problems. Look at the table, how the table is all twisted and distorted, all right? Then you look at the saddle. Well, part of the reason the table's all twisted and distorted is the saddle is not providing the stiffness and rigidity needed by the table. 
You'll also notice in this particular case, the column is bowing or moving as well. Well, again, how do these, how do these axes, X, Y, and Z, relate to each other? Well, it's all through the structure of the machine tool. And last but not least, look at the spindle carrier there at the top. Again, it's deflecting. So it's got weakness all through. It's got weakness in the table as a result of the knee or saddle being weak. The column is not sufficient to support the spindle carrier. So if you can, just imagine, again, going back to that Cartesian coordinate system where squareness, parallelism, straightness of those axes are critical to put features in a machined part. So imagine chasing precision on that particular machine tool. How does a machine position? Well, if you think about it, for each axis of a machine, there's actually seven degrees of freedom. You've got horizontal straightness, you've got vertical straightness, you have squareness of the axes to each other. And then as you start moving, you have roll, pitch, and yaw. So you got seven degrees, well, and then everybody knows of these. You got positioning, accuracy, and repeatability once you get moving again. So there's your seven degrees of freedom. Well, I've got three axes on a classic three axis machine tool. So three times seven, that means there's basic, basically 21 total degrees of freedom. There's 21 things moving around here that I've got to control in order to position that machine accurately. Let's take a look at a couple of these. Let's start with straightness. What is straightness? Well, here's the Z axis and here's Z prime. Is Z moving straight when it goes up and down in Z axis? Same thing with X as the table moves side to side. Is it moving X or X prime? And obviously you have the same problem with the Y axis. So now there's a, a standard. It's the Japanese industrial standard. And the tolerance for a machine tool for straightness is 0.008 millimeters or 8 micron over the full stroke. Well, if you think about that, on a typical 40 by 20 machine, let's say 40 in X by 20 in Y by 18 in Z, that means you're going to have a straightness error over the full travel of each axis of 0.008 millimeters or 8 micron. So that's what the spec says is acceptable. That's the tolerance. There's what it is in inches, 315 thousandths for each axis. I'm sorry, 315 millions. Well, another one is squareness, and this is the relationship of the major axes. The squareness of Z to Y is one of them. The squareness of X, the table side to side, to Z and the squareness of the table moving front to back, y, to x. So those are the major squareness that's going to determine your Cartesian coordinate system. Again, let's go back to a, a standard. The JIS, or Japanese Industrial Standard, tolerance is 0 0.010 millimeters, which is 10 microns over the full stroke of each axis. So again, with your typical 40 by 20 size machine, you're looking at a squareness of 10 micron for each axis, X, Y, and Z, which is 394 millionths of an inch for each axis. So let's go back and look. In a real or ideal world, if you had a target out here at you know 40 by 20, by 18, there's where the target would be. But the problem is your squareness of the X to Y is not square. The squareness of your Y to X is not square, nor is your Z to Y square. So consequently, 
The cube isn't really the shaded cube that we're looking at. It's the other cube depicted by the axis unsquareness, if you will. So where you thought you were going is the target. Where you actually ended up is the actual position that you can see there in yellow. Now, if I built the machine right on the edge of the JIS standards, that's the best I could hope for right there. So let's do a geometric error budget. Let's look at straightness. Let's look at squareness. Let's look at three axes, X, Y, and Z. Um, and again, you'll see the straightness is 8 micron. The squareness is 10 micron. There it is in inches as well. So if I go in there, there's the calculations. And now I'm going to go in there. There's the straightness, vertical and horizontal straightness. And there is the squareness measures, major axes, X to Y to Z. Now, again, keep in mind, I've got a drawing, and there are numbers on that drawing. Those numbers are distances, and there's tolerances associated with those. Well, how do I produce that part? I produce that by moving X, Y, and Z from feature to feature. And I do that on a machine tool. So this is where squareness, straightness, parallel, all that stuff comes into play. I got an X of 40, a Y of 20, and a Z of 18. Ideal performance, I'd be 40 by 20 by 18. I'd be in that little red box right there, ideally. But we've just talked at target be 40 by 20 by 18. We've, and that's the little blue box. But we've just talked about x-axis has straightness and squareness issues. y-axis has straightness and squareness issues. z-axis has straightness and squareness issues. Now, if I take those into account and I start over again, there's my target. But actually, I'm going to end up here at some number 40.000709. Y is 27.009 and 18. So now I've got errors. And there, if I move linearly, linearly, there's what those errors are in inches for X, Y, and Z. Remember the target tolerances we started chasing. We said 2 thou to 3 thou. Okay, well. You'll notice that just moving in a straight line in X, Y, or Z, I've already, depending on the tolerance, 2 thou or 3, I've already used 24 to 36, so almost a third of my tolerance in my error budget. If I move diagonally in two axes, now I'm 0 .001. Well, that could be anywhere from 34 to 50% of my allowable tolerance. And then finally, what if I move diagonally in X, Y, and Z? Well, that number, as you can see, is already over a thou. So it's more than half of the two thou tolerance and getting into a substantial portion of the three thou. So we're now almost half to two thirds, 62 percent of the allowable tolerance and that's just in geometric errors. So you can see if I'm trying to chase a two or three thou tolerance, I've used up a significant portion of that tolerance just in geometrical errors. Now, that's just the geometry of the machine. What happens when I start moving the machine to get from point A to point B? Well, motion implies positioning accuracy and positioning repeatability. So let's take a look at positioning. Again, X, Y, and Z. What do the JIS, and I'm going back to JIS because a lot of builders, that's, that's the base. That's their, their touchstone. Positioning is plus or minus 25 micron. Repeatability is 10 micron. So 78 millions. And that, again, is a 40 by 20 
by 18 machine. So there's your positioning accuracies and repeatability tolerance. Now, keep in mind now with positioning, you have the target, but you have positioning accuracy, which means you could be plus or minus. And then at those endpoints, the plus or minus of positioning, you have repeatability, which means you could be plus or minus. So that's schematically what it's going to look like. There again, 25 micron positioning, plus or minus 10 micron repeatability. Here, I'm going to go back and say, here's my target. Now, here's my positioning accuracy, plus or minus. So, you can see, that's a pretty good band already of error. Now, once I position, I have repeatability around those positions. So, there's my plus and minus repeatability of the upper end and I'm going to have the same thing on the lower end plus and minus repeatability. So when you add this all together you're looking at plus or minus 178 millions minus or plus. So that's your positioning error. Keep in mind now, this is above and beyond the geometric errors we've already talked about in uh, earlier in the slides. Account for the positioning, we can go in here and say, okay, there's your plus X, here's your plus Y, there's your plus Z. So now we can create a box around that, and there's where your actual position would end up being not the target down there in the middle at gold, in gold. So if I go out and I actually calculate, there's where I wanted to be. 40 in X by 20 in Y by 18 in Z. The problem is my final actual position ends up 40 plus, 20 plus, 18 plus. Okay? And if you look at that, it's a combination of geometry and positioning. So that's where I actually end up. And again, if we remember the tolerances we were chasing, two to three thou. If you look in the linear axes, we're almost at a thou, 50% of the tolerance on the smaller, the two thou. If you look at a diagonal, two dimensional, we're 46, 50 to three quarters, 68%. And then if you look at a three axis move, we're 84, again, depending on whether we're looking at the smaller 2,000 or the bigger 3,000, we're 84%. So you can see how very quickly, if you're looking at a drawing, you got a 2,000 tolerance, you've already used up just getting from point to point positioning there, geometry and positioning, you've used up 84, 85% of your tolerance. Also, key thing to look at, look at the source of the errors. Geometric contribution is the bigger, it's 82% of the error, whereas the positioning contributes 18%. Now, if you think about the way people try to attack accuracy, it's kind of counterintuitive to those numbers Everybody wants to put scales on the machine because they think it makes the machine more accurate. Well, you'll notice here the geometric contribution is significantly larger than the positioning contribution, which gets us into talking about volumetric accuracy. What's the result of all of this? Well, this is a video. Uh, it's a D200Z machine, and there's a ball bar. This is a tilt rotary table with a ball bar on it, and what we're going to do this is the ultimate result of your geometries and we're moving axes here so for positioning accuracies and repeatabilities. Okay, you'll notice here the the readout it's some pretty big numbers initially that's because we're bringing the spindle down to contact the ball. Now we're in contact and you look at those they're fractions of a micron and we're now moving the c-axis which means we're moving x, y as well. 
In a minute, we're going to start rotating the tilt axis, the B axis. There we go. So now this is a true five axis motion. We're moving X, Y, Z, tilt, and rotary axes. There's a 1.2, 1.4, you know, 1.9, 1.7. That's micron, and that's measured over the entire working volume of a D200Z machine. So I would contend that that is extremely good control over not only geometries, but positioning accuracies and repeatabilities as well. That's the ultimate conclusion of all of this work. It's even more important in die mold because you're doing volume. If I'm going to mold this part, I need to make the core and cavity. Well, every point is related to every other point. So I have to have them very accurate in space, as you can see on most cores and cavities that you're looking at there. So volumetric accuracy is extremely, more, extremely important on die and mold work as well. But, you know, is the machine tool structure important? I think we've talked about how you make parts and how it's related to the Cartesian coordinate system that's on the machine. And I think this, the, the answer is yes, it's extremely important. The other thing to keep in mind, we talked about die mold and it being 3D and all this. Most parts are 3D in nature. Or why would you buy a three-axis XYZ machine tool to make it? I mean, there's various heights. There's positioning relative to a base, uh, side to side, so yes. With that in mind, are there solutions to make a machine more accurate? And this gets into, if you will, how we build them at Makino. Casting design, you'll notice very large, heavy-duty castings provides very good stiffness and rigidity. It ensures the geometries. It ensures that you're not going to have bending and deflection like this, which means you're going to have very good Cartesian coordinate system replication on the machine tool. Symmetrical in design, you'll notice, if the temperature changes in your shop, it grows symmetrically, therefore maintaining the geometries of the machine. Are there other solutions? Yeah, fully supported. You notice the x-axis, no matter where it's at, the y, the table, no matter where it's at, the z-axis is fully supported throughout its entire travel. So again, you're not getting distortion. The stiffness, the straightness, the parallelism, all of that is tied together. The other thing is we use extensively finite element analysis. Some of those diagrams we showed you at the beginning, that's what we use in order to make sure that we have the stiffness and rigidity we need to ensure, there, there you go, the, the diagrams we showed you originally. Very stiff, very rigid, eliminate distortion, enhance precision of the machine tool. The way we build them as well. Design and construction techniques. We utilize the castings for the stiffness and rigidity typical of a casting. But you'll notice that we cut into the casting to put the linear guideway. The linear guideway is what gives you your speed in your linear axes. For flatness, you'll notice that red, that's the machine surface that gives us the flatness for the way, the, the linear guideway there. Here's another straightness, you'll notice that. That's the shoulder that we push up against, and you'll notice the pushers and the bolts through. Again, to tie down that geometry, not only to tie it down, but to tie it into the stiffness and rigidity of the base of the machine. Also, parallelism, we do that on one side and compare it and do it on the other side as well. Are there other solutions? Yes, let's talk about design and construction relative to the guideways themselves, the linear guides. The selections of components can be very important. We utilize the one on the far left. It's a 45 millimeter. Most of the competition is 35 to 30. So that's how you handle overturning moments into the guideway, stiffness and rigidity. Upsize the linear guides. Gives you stiffer, more rigid motion. More moment control which maintains, there's your 
As you're moving, what comes into play now is roll, pitch, and yaw. That's controlled by, number one, tying the linear guideways down into the bed, but then also upsizing the linear guideways to take care of the moments from that in your roll, pitch, and yaw. This talks about the guideway itself, linear guideway. Selection. Go with roller guide design for stiffer, more rigid componentry. Handles a greater force, better cutting conditions. It has a line contact rather than like a ball. A ball only has a point contact. There you can see with your roller guide, there's your line contact over here versus with the roller, it's got a point contact. So again, stiffness, rigidity, better cutting handling capability. Other solutions, well, we, we talked a little bit about JIS. What we can do is rather than starting out and, and targeting the goal of JIS, we can take those tolerances and we can cut them in half. By doing that, as we build the machine, we're constantly building it to one half of the stated established JIS spec. That means our geometry error, all of our errors, are going to be cut in half. We do that by using proven construction techniques and practices. And the other thing we do is, if this is the JIS tolerance, we, toler we target half of that. And in practice, we practice and want to achieve half of that tolerance. So therefore, the machine's going to be very precise. Finely honed assembly skills allows us to do that. Best practices achieved over years and years of assembly, 85 years of experience in building machine tools. We build to half of the smaller tolerance. We control the process from the casting, actually machining the castings, from the time the casting goes on the floor as we assemble the machine. We verify each and every step. We don't try to add precision on at the end. It's built quality from the ground up. Don't try to add it later. Ball screws, that's another, you know, what about pretensioning ball screws? Well, um, this subject's changed quite a bit. As you can see here, we used to, you know, you can pre-tension a ball screw as you can see there in red, but if you're not doing it in the right spot, what happens is the whole ball screw will shift back and forth. So that's the problem there is, you know, you've pre-tensioned it, but you've pre-tensioned it outside the bearing area, so consequently the whole ball screw is going to shift, which is not good for positioning accuracy and repeatability. If you're going to pre-tension it, you want to pre-tension it in between the bearings so as it grows, it's going to grow back to normal length and therefore enhance your positioning accuracies and repeatabilities. You want to maintain a constant preload so you have same performance across the realm of performance. It eliminates lost motion. It also saves whip or wobble bowing movement. A lot of people are trying to go with unsupported ball screws downstream and you can get an idea of how that's going to whip or wobble. Uh, now another thing that's come on and we do in our machines is ball screw temperature control. It used to be why did you pre-tension? Well you pre-tension because the ball screw got warm and it grew and therefore you've got to adjust so that when you're working with the ball screw you're getting good numbers out of it for positioning accuracy and repeatability. But if you go in and temperature control, bring oil in around the bearings and through the ball screw and out, if you temperature control the ball screw, thermal growth of the ball screw becomes much, much less of a problem because you've addressed the major issue, which is temperature. There's also some other advantages. For example, you have shorter warm-up cycles. You have a lower stabilization temperature of the entire assembly. You have less thermal growth. You have reduced operating temperature, so it's going to operate at a lower temperature. And then any time you reduce the operating temperatures, you have longer, mechanically, you have longer component life.
fine pitch ball screws. This is another thing we do, particularly on die mold machines. A lot of the competitors have a 16 millimeter pitch. So that means for one rotation, you move 16 millimeters, 0.31 something inches. We have an eight millimeter pitch. What does that mean? By using a finer pitch ball screw, we move half the distance and get the same amount of points. So the ability to divide into more and more points is critical, which again on die mold is critical to maintaining very good surfaces, surface finish, position, accuracy, repeatability. Better accuracy, better blends and matches because we have more points in a typical rotation of the ball screw. We can minimize hand finishing. That's one of the main objectives in die mold is to get it off and not have to spend as much time polishing afterwards as you did to machine it. So minimize hand finishing, particularly in die mold applications. And what this is is a little chart that shows uh, you know, eight millimeter pitch ball screw versus 16. And the fact here that you look at, we're getting twice as many points in the same amount of distance. So we can discern point to point to point much finer. What about scales? Okay. We use scales on XYZ on most of our equipment. Um, do scales make a difference? Absolutely. As you can see here, this is the positioning, accuracy and repeating target for a machine without scales. Here's the positioning, accuracy, and repeatability target for a machine with scales. So yes, it's taken and reduced that target. So yes, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. Obviously, scale feedback provides better accuracy. But go back to the example that we went through, the numbers and the error budget. Remember, the positioning error was only about 20%. The old 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of it was geometries. So if you build a machine that's not square or straight or parallel and you slap scales on it, it's going to address, scales are going to address the 18 or 20%. It's not going to address the bigger elephant in the room, which is the positioning accuracies, I'm sorry, the uh, squareness, straightness, parallelism, the geometries of the machine. Scales obviously are looking at the final position of the moving element relative to the linear scare scale, not at a feedback from an encoder at the end of the motor. So that's how they're more accurate, smaller target. Um, another thing that, that we do, particularly, it's a Makino S thing, we utilize Mori scales. Most people don't understand what Mori is. Mori was a French scientist all the way back and what he discovered was that if you have a scale that's fixed in a moving scale and you flash a light through, that you can count optical fringe pattern interference. So there's kind of the schematic of what's going on. And actually, there's what happens. You've got a stationary scale, a moving scale, and you'll notice these are fringe patterns. Now, on most of our machines, the divisions on those scales are 0.05 micron. Some of our machines, it's 0.025 micron. So you can imagine the precision of those fringe patterns. So it's optical. Is that good? Yes, that's good. There's non-contact versus magnetic, where there's issues and problems. It's non-contacting. 0.05 micron for most of our equipment, 0.025 micron on some of it. Longevity, precision, because it's non-contacting, it's not going to wear and tear. It's going to maintain the precision over the life of the element. They're put into a sealed box and pressurized, so coolant and, and uh, the environment chips are not going to impact the precision. And it gives you tighter control over your positioning accuracy and repeatability. The other thing is, as you put a scale on a machine, you got to remember, we go back, we went back to straightness. And what was straightness? It was the difference between X and X prime. Well, if the scale's not lined up perfectly with X, 
you end up with what's called an Abbey offset. So there's an angle in here between the angle of the scale and the true motion of the axis. So you have to have very tight control over the alignment of the scale so that it's reading on the same axis as the scale and not offset by some angle to avoid what's called Abbey, Abbey offsets. And that's, you see there in the red, that's what would happen if the scale is not aligned with the axis. So the further down you go, the more error you're going to have because of the offset. What about scales? You remember that machine back at the beginning of this? What do you think scale feedback is going to do for this situation? It's not going to correct the issue with the machine. Matter of fact, all of those finite element analysis stuff we did at the beginning, scales is not going to correct squareness, straightness, those kinds of issues. Stiffness and rigidity is the problem. Component deflection is the problem. Distortion is the problem. Geometric problems. And remember, we said 80% of the errors are typically associated with geometry, about 18 to 20 with position and accuracy and repeatability. That concludes today's presentation. Uh, I'd like to take a minute and take a look at the uh, questions and see if we can get back to you on some of your questions that occurred during our presentation. So number one, I'd like to apologize. We did run over a little bit on time, so we're going to kind of limit the, the questions. The one question that, that came in was, why did we choose JIS standard? Uh, well, there are primarily two major standards today that are typically used. JIS uh, is the Japanese industrial standard, and that's primarily for a lot of the builders in Japan and Singapore, that area of the, the world. And then the other one is DIN, which is German and, and the European market. Um, now, although they're two different standards in two different parts of the world, they actually both tie back to the ISO, ISO, and I think it's ISO 230. They share a lot. I mean, there's only so many ways you can define squareness and straightness and parallelism. So um, that uh, was, we'll take that question as the one question. Um, I, again, I'd like to apologize. We ran over a little bit on time. Uh, I'd like to remind you that if you signed up for this uh, Experience Center presentation, you will be getting an email and there'll be a link in that email that will allow you to re-watch re this. Or if you have folks in your office that you think, hey, they might want to see this, you can pass that on. In addition, this will be recorded and it'll be added to our uh, webinar archive at Makino. And you can get to that at www.makino.com. Again, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today for this Experience Center.